Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. So today we are going to break down how to have a successful fall cover crop. Yeah, I think that satisfies an intro. Let's do it. Okay, so we've done quite a few videos at this point on cover cropping. They're my favorite. And we have covered a lot of the nuances, but I wanted to make sure as we head into this fall cover crop planting season that you all are equipped with everything you need to grow successful cover crop and not have a complete and total mess to deal with in the spring because it happens and it's not fun. First, winter killed cover crops need to go in early but not too early or you will get seeds which are just weeds in the raw. My cutoff for winter killed cover crops, that's cover crops that die over the winter, is around September 20th but I'd rather have them all sown by September 15th. We are in Kentucky, zone 6B, and so the further north you go, or the colder you get if you're not in the United States, you will want to sow winter killed cover crops a bit earlier than that, a little further south, and you can sow slightly later. Winter killed cover crops consist of things like field peas, oats, any summer grasses like sorghum sudan grass, etc. That is, things that will die in the cold. If you only get some light freezes over the winter, go with something super tender like cow peas, beans, and sorghum sudan grass, things like that. Not field peas like we use up here in Kentucky and definitely not oats. They don't always winter kill for us. So they probably, the further south you get, the less likely it is for them to winter kill. The goal is to establish a really good stand of cover crop with a good amount of above ground biomass so that when it dies from a few freezes in November and December, or maybe even into January, the plant material will lightly mulch the soil for the winter. It is not a weed suppressant level of mulch, but it will hold the soil in place. And then you can rake that aside and plant into those beds in the spring with little or no effort. In northern climates or very cold climates, this is the type of cover crop I would generally recommend as things like rye can take a long time in the spring to get ready to terminate. My friends in North Dakota told me they cannot typically terminate rye until the middle of summer, which would be way too late for most cash crops, but I'm getting ahead of myself. It's kind of a skill I have. Now, in terms of winter hardy cover crops, that would be cover crops that can survive the winter, you can plant those much later. I prefer to get mine in by November 1st, but I planted them as late as January. What you don't want is to get winter hardy cover crops in so early that they grow tall and die in the freezes. Or worse, they maybe only partially die in the freezes, and then you have a spotty cover crop to deal with in the spring. Winter hardy cover crops for us are things like vetch, rye, winter wheat, crimson clover, Austrian winter pea and lacy phacelia, so long as you plant that last one later. In fact, things like lacy phacelia and field peas can both overwinter as long as they are planted later in the season, like November. If you plant them early, they'll die. If you plant them later, they'll be small when they germinate and they'll survive most of the winter and then they'll flower in the spring. And again, if you plant them too early, they could also go to seed. I also, where possible, like to throw cilantro in there. Uh, my current favorite cover crop mix is lacy phacelia crimson clover and cilantro sown in late October. Sowing it that late means they will stay small, like I said, and therefore be more hardy. Then in the spring, you will get a noisy patch of flowers busy with beneficials. My retirement goals are to grow that mix and just stand there and listen to it. And also maybe make some more retirement goals in my retirement. If you want to get a little wild with your overwintered cover cropping and put your hair down a bit, throw some kale in there as well. Makes a great flower, survives the winter pretty well. With that in mind, we need to talk about how to choose between winter hardy and winter killed cover crops. And it all comes down to your crop plan for next year. If you do not know your crop plan, then the answer is winter killed cover crops. That's it, period, full stop. With the winter killed cover crops, you do not have a cover crop sod in your way come springtime. That's the value there. Then, like I said, you can just rake off what mulch is there and plant. Then if you decide you don't need those particular beds or that space for a little while longer, you can always sow something like spinach or radishes early on in like March, April, May, and that will hold you until June. If you do know your crop plan, then you can gear your cover crops around that. For instance, maybe you put the beds you need earliest for carrots, lettuce, radishes, potatoes, onions, etc., into winter killed cover crops so those beds are ready and then put the beds you don't need for things like field tomatoes or sweet corn or sweet potatoes or whatever else you have going in around June, maybe you put those areas into winter hardy cover crops because 
you don't need them right away. Basically, at least here in Kentucky, our cover crops are not ready to terminate until mid-May at earliest, so we can't usually plant them until late May or early June reliably. Honestly, I love winter-killed cover crops because they mean I don't really have to think that hard about my crop plan until the winter, but when I know what is going there, winter-hardy cover crops can have longer-lasting soil health benefits, so it's good to employ them where possible. Also, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of incorporating legumes like beans, peas, that sort of stuff into your cover crop mixes. I always like to make sure these get at least a little bit nerdy, and a recent meta-analysis from Indiana University found that legumes and cover crops consistently showed yield increases, whereas single-species cover crops like rye showed no real boost in yield. So, always be leguming, always be learning, always be leguming. That just does not portmanteau well. The biggest mistake anyone can make with cover crops is simply assuming that just because you planted them, they are going to grow and be awesome. They may do neither. Like seeding anything, cover crops have to be nurtured into life. Seeds need good soil preparation and good seed to soil contact no matter what that seed is. Seeds need moisture to germinate and decent soil conditions and fertility to grow. Cover crops can do a range of good things to soil as I've discussed in this video, but they are not miracle workers. They will not just up and transform hard pan into fluffy tilth. Anyway, in poor soil conditions, more likely than not, cover crops will just struggle to grow. And if the cover crop struggles, so too will your subsequent cash crop. You can kind of think of cover crops like the canary in the coal mine, but like C-O-L-E, coal. Yeah, that works. So as I will say a million times throughout my career, treat your cover crops like cash crops. Prep the soil well, sow them at the right depths and densities, water them well, or time them around rains, quit it when, make sure the weed situation is managed well, all that stuff. I even often will spray my cover crops with compost teas and extracts as well as prime the seeds with different compost teas or microbially rich preparations to maximize that effort. And if you're like, you do what now? Here's a video on seed priming. It's worth watching. The last thing I should talk about that probably could also have been in the first thing that I talked about is how to decide what to put into the mix itself and how much of each. For what to put in, obviously you have to determine if it's a winter killed cover crop that you need and if it will winter kill in your region. Some things like crimson clover actually are winter killed cover crops further north than us, so you do kind of have to research that a little bit. For us, peas terminate fine in the winter, whereas like I said, oats do not always. In other regions, peas may survive the winter just fine. So take into consideration your climate and your plan for the gardens the following season, but also take into account what you hope to get out of the cover crops. Legumes are famous for nitrogen fixation. So like I said, those should almost always be in the mix. Grasses and grains, those things are excellent for building soil and things like rye help produce a chemical in their roots to suppress weeds. So that could be a reason to choose those. Grains and grasses also produce a lot of above ground biomass that is relatively stable. So you get a little mulch in the process. I don't care as much about the mulch because the mulch doesn't hang out very long in my hot, humid climate, and you may not want a mulch anyway. Uh, may not be the goal for what you, you know, plan to put in those beds anyway. So maybe you stick to more tender stuff like brassicas, clovers, flowers, those sorts of things. That will help you build and enrich your soil and not provide much of a mulch that you have to deal with in the spring. In terms of quantities, I know this feels like cheating, but just start with what the recommendations are from the seed purveyor. And for your seed order, divide the recommended seeding rate by the number of species in the mix. Doing math in YouTube videos is everyone's favorite, so get ready to smash that like button as the adults pretending to be kids say, what I mean by divide the recommended seeding rate by the number of species is that let's say the seeding rate is 75 pounds per acre for cereal rye but you're adding three other species to that cover crop mix. You would divide 75 pounds by four species and only by 18 to 20 pounds per acre of the rye. Does that make sense? Looks like this. And then you do the same math for the rest of the species in the mix. That's just a starting point though. You may find that you had too much of one species or not enough of one and some folks have strong opinions about these ratios, which you can feel free to put in the comment section if you'd like to be helpful, but just plant based on those recommendations to start, 
and take some notes, especially if the planting is too thin or too thick and adjust next year. Generally speaking, I've rarely seen a cover crop stand that was too thick so long as the soil is in good condition, but you will lose some of that above ground mulching if, it's, if the stand is too dense. So you'll just have to play around with it. There is no cut and dry rule for this. It depends a little bit on your moisture levels. It depends a little bit on your season, your temperatures, all those things, even the seed that you use. You will also find that the size of each of these seeds within the mix is often all over the place. So what I do is hand broadcast the clovers and smallest seeds and then run them over with the seeder while I seed the bigger seeds. Uh, the beet plate on the earthway does the trick pretty well for most grains, but you will just have to match the seed plate or roller to the seed, then make sure to water them all in really well. Again, treat this cover crop like a cash crop or it will just become a weed. We've done some videos in the past on termination, so if you need more info on that, watch this video here. Anyway, totally unrelated to this video, our buddy Dan Brisebois, host of the Seed Farmer podcast, just wrote a brand new book, and it is on pre-order now at notoldgrowers.com, and it is amazing. I got uh, to read an early copy if you're wondering how I know it's amazing, and it was amazing. Perfect for people who run a market garden and want to save some of their own seed. Uh, more on that book soon, but let me know your thoughts on cover cropping in terms of what you would do different or wouldn't do that I do or any other recommendations that you have. What did I miss? What did I get wrong? If you would like to learn more about living soil and no-till systems and cover cropping, I highly recommend the Living Soil Handbook. I mean, I wrote it. Of course, I recommend it, but you can also get that from notillgrowers.com. It is also currently available in French and soon Italian and German, which is wild. You can't get the translated versions from us, though. You have to buy those in countries that speak those respective languages. So, yeah. Also, I recommend this SARE publication called Managing Cover Crops Profitably, which is free and also excellent. Otherwise, like this video if you like this video. If you are not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. If you are subscribed, you're awesome. Support our work at patreon.com slash no-till growers. That truly is the best thing you can do to ensure this work keeps happening. Or you can always just hit that super thanks button. That works too. All right. Super thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. Killed deed to soil contact or microbial rich. Microbial. Microbial.